right, so this is the uh, forest garden project that um, uh, I started in 1994. Um, so uh, just to, to uh, begin with, I'll, I'll define what I mean by forest garden because I expect most of you have a pretty good idea anyway. Um, but what I mean by a forest garden is, uh, you know, it's a three-dimensional garden um, using trees of different sizes, certainly in a garden this scale, tall trees, smaller trees, shrubs, uh, stuff growing on the perennial layer as well, um, all designed to work together as much as possible, minimise competition, designed to be very low input system, uh, the inputs, energy, my energy mostly, um, uh, and be fairly productive. Um, now in our climate, a forest garden has to be, has to have a fairly open structure. So it is not like a forest. Uh, let's make that clear to begin with, which is a slight problem with the name, but I didn't coin the name. Uh, because when you say forest in our culture, people tend to think, that where you can see the conifers over there, that kind of forest, high forest, canopies touching of trees, and in that situation, there's a deep shade underneath, and you can actually do very little productively, you know, in that kind of shade in our climate. There's not enough sun energy gets down to, to grow very much at all. Um, so, uh, in our climate, a forest garden has to have a much more open structure. It's more like that of a young woodland, young establishing woodland, and it's maintained, you know, at that kind of uh, level. Um, so, um, forest gardens. Uh, I mean, everybody's forest garden is different. There are hundreds in, in this country now um, uh, because they're always designed around the needs of, of whoever's garden it is. Uh, but usually they have mostly edible plants in, but they may have other things too. And certainly this forest garden is it's partly demonstration and partly research. Um, and so I have a lot of different plants in. I have medicinal plants and plants for fiber use and plants for dyeing uh, and all sorts of stuff as well. So. Um, you know, when I say it's a garden of useful plants, of course, useful can mean different things to different people. And useful doesn't necessarily mean directly useful to humans. You know, it's actually something you pick. Um, because there are, there are plants in here and in most forest gardens that have uh, a function to, uh, to, to aid the whole system. Uh, and not to be directly used by me. So comfrey is a good example. This is the true medicinal comfrey, Symphytum officinale, beneath this um, apricot tree. And uh, although it is a medicinal plant, um, really it's here for two reasons, two main functions. One is to help feed the fruit tree, and the other is as a fantastic bee plant as well. Um, so none of those you know, are a direct harvest to me, um, but they're very important functions to keep everything uh, sustained you know, and sustainable. Because whatever system you have of growing plants, uh, you know, if it's mainly for food or whatever. Um, if you want your system to be sustainable, you have to devote some of the resources in that system to, you know, uh, sustaining the system itself. Um, so a bit like, you know, um, in a rotation, having a green manure year, you know, in amongst other, other plants. You know, you have to devote some of the area, some of the time, to plants with a system function. Uh, because that's the only way you can get sustainability. Okay, um, do stop me and fire off questions, okay, as we go. Can I just ask you, yes. how is that comfrey useful to that um, tree? Yeah, um, comfrey works uh, because it's a, it's a very deep-rooted mineral accumulator and the, the root structure of comfrey is very different from that of a fruit tree. Most of the roots on this apricot tree will be about this deep, uh, you know, 30, 40 centimetres deep and go outwards. It have very few uh, deep tap roots. Whereas comfrey has, uh, has a lot of deep tap roots and they'll go, so, so rooting wise they don't use the same soil areas uh, very much. And um, so comfrey, can, comfrey roots might well go down four, three or four metres, five metres maybe. Uh, it's hard to know exactly, but some, you know, around that. Um, and comfrey is particularly good at getting uh, potassium out of the soil. Um, so all parts of comfrey are very rich in potassium, the top and of course all the roots as well. And uh, how that becomes available to other plants like this tree is um, uh, some becomes available anyway just through the normal growing process and the uh, comfrey uh, dying down in autumn. 
because when, when it dies down, of course, some nutrients are taken back into the roots by the comfrey itself, but others just rot down, you know, in the dead stems into the soil, uh, and so they become available for other plants. Um, but that process can be, um, uh, in, it, well, uh, increased, if you like, by cutting and mulching with the comfrey a couple of, two or three times a year. So I usually do that after it's finished flowering. I'll usually uh, just cut it off and let it fall. That's where it is, especially you know, if it's under a fruit tree, because that's what needs potassium. It's fruit trees that need potassium because uh, flowering and fruiting needs, needs a lot of potassium to sustain it. Um, and so, you know, if you're, going, if you're going to have a lot of fruit trees, then uh, certainly comfrey is one of the best things you can have to feed them with. Either, you know, it can actually be grown beneath the tree or you could have it grown somewhere else and cut and mulch and use it as a mulch, fresh mulch, you know, underneath a, a fruit tree. Okay. So this um, forest garden started off um, in 1994 as a pasture field. So there was nothing growing here. Uh, it's bordered by the high conifers you can see to the west there and ash trees. They're just outside the forest garden. Um, uh, and I chose this field. I had a choice of, of sites on the Dartington estate. And I chose this site um, for various reasons. But one reason was it had fantastic protection from the west. So due, it's due west is where the the ash and conifer trees are over there, uh, and uh, you know shelter uh, in a you know in a windy part of the country, shelter is worth its weight in gold. Uh, it will improve the, the growth of um, trees, you know, twofold probably. Uh, and anything fruiting will will actually you know become productive much more quickly, and production will build up much more quickly in a sheltered site. So, um, although there's some shading issues, obviously near that near that big edge there. Um, which is not a problem because I mean, there are shade tolerance to things you can put there. Um, you know, I'm quite prepared to put up with that in return for fantastic shelter. If I hadn't had shelter there, I'd have had to grow shelter. Um, and probably I would have grown something fast growing like Italian alder, which is tall trees within the forest garden here. You can see our Italian alders. Uh, those are, those are uh, 16 years old from seed. Um, uh, and they're a fantastic windbreak tree, get very big very quickly, and they would, they would have given me decent protection by now but in the process it, you know this wouldn't be so established if I'd had to grow shelter so shelter is really important and if people often you know people often ask me for advice or sometimes consultancy about you know uh, setting up their own forest gardens and shelter is always the first thing to think about it's very tempting not to it's very tempting to think I want fruit trees you know get those fruit trees in straight away but actually you should think shelter first uh, because uh, the trees will do better uh, if, you, if, if that's the way you do it, you know. Um, and very often if people don't, they realise two or three years later actually they have to, they really should have put shelter in, they then put it in, you know. But really, it should be something you think about right at the beginning. Okay, so um, uh, this forest garden then is about uh, coming up to 17 years old, and um, I spent the first two or three years planting. Uh, the main trees that are forming the high, uh, highest layer, if you like, or canopy layer in the forest garden. It's not high, you know, very high trees everywhere, um, uh, because you know shade is an issue. So, so you can't have too many high trees because you can start to get too much shading beneath. Um, and then I underplanted uh, most of the forest garden uh, over about the next ten years. It doesn't have to take you that long when you make a forest garden, but uh, on this site, various things uh, uh, led me to that kind of uh, length. One is the size, it's just over two acres, which as forest gardens go is probably above average, you know, in this country. There's people making forest, forest gardens from, up, well, up to five acres or so, bigger than this, right down to, you know, small back garden sized forest gardens, where obviously you might have to make some compromises in terms of tree size and stuff. Um, so two acres is a lot to plant out, to underplant especially. The trees aren't so bad on two acres, it's only about 200 trees or something you know, you're going to plant. But, but uh, the underplanting uh, is uh, you know, uh, much more of a task really and that's um, something you need to plan in advance how long it's going to take you. Um, so I, I, because I was the only one doing the work, I portioned that up into around 10 years of underplanting. So pretty much most of it is underplanted now. Um, there are little patches that get replanted every now and then because I'm experimenting and one of the experiments I'm doing is mixing different plants in the perennial layers and see what grows with what because there's very little serious work being done on that or written about it. 
and sometimes those experiments work and of course sometimes they don't and if they don't I'll often mulch them out uh, with uh, sometimes with areas of cardboard like you can just see uh, in amongst this area there are some areas of cardboard um, and then replant with something else. So there are little bits of replanting on an ongoing basis but most of it is, is fairly well underplanted. Okay, so where you're, from where you're standing now, <coughs> this is quite an open and sunny entrance into the forest garden here. Uh, just in this, in this area up here, there's not going to be any higher trees really than this apricot. Um, and the, uh, the tree with all the tiny little pale green fruits on is, a, is, a, is Szechuan pepper. We'll have a look at that in a minute. And there's a mulberry to its left. Um, uh, and that's a dwarf, a type of dwarf chestnut there that looks like a chestnut tree. Um, so fair, fairly low trees here with a, a, a quite an open sunny area. So there's quite a lot of uh, interesting perennial vegetables that need quite good light conditions right in front of us here. Um, so uh, one which has just finished flowering, and it's got these, well, a few flowers left, these little yellow flowers, um, big, quite big plants, a lot of them have keeled over a bit, um, is Turkish rocket. Uh, it's a very nice perennial um, brassica. Um, and the, uh, the young flower shoots, even now, uh, are quite nice to nibble. So as you come past this, if you want to, it's, it tastes a bit like a mustardy version of broccoli. If you want to nibble, nibble on one of those and go past, it's fine. The main crop on this is before these flowers open, and it's like broccoli, you know, and the unopened flower clump, basically, is, is, is the main thing you eat. You can also eat the leaves, uh, but they're very, very hot at this time of year. They're better in spring, you know, you, they're, they're, they're fiery hot at this time of year, the leaves are. Um, uh, there's some other perennial vegetables, so for instance the, um, uh, you can see a plant that looks like nasturtium climbing up some canes just there in front of the Szechuan pepper, uh, and that is a type of nasturtium, it's, it's a tuberous nasturtium called mashua, and that's a, root, that's a tuber crop from South America, it's one of the, the Andean uh, tuber crops. Um, it grows, it grows very well here, you can eat the leaves, they're peppery like ordinary nasturtium leaves. Um, you don't get a lot of flowers on this one. Um, but you get big tubers, you know, decent potato-sized tubers on that, and lots of them, and that grows very well. Um, and as you can, see, and, it, and and it kind of it clambers. So I, you know, I've li given it some canes, and it clambers into a bush. And that's that's how clambering things tend to grow in the wild. They're on the often on the southern edge, you know, of a shrub or a bush, and they can clamber up to get into the light. So you know, in a forest garden, I'm trying to mimic what happens in nature as much as possible, and. Um, uh, you know, that's one reason that a forest garden is very low input. It's because on the scale of, you know, agriculture, um, the further you are from a forest, which is what the land is trying to get to in our climate, the further you are from a forest, the more energy you have to put in to maintain it. So, you know, an arable crop or annual vegetables are the most energy intensive because in most areas anyway, the, the ground is cultivated every year. Soil cultivation is very, very energy intensive. You know, ploughing or digging, whatever uh, way it's done, is very energy intensive. And actually, ultimately, I don't think agriculture is sustainable um, with a, a almost total reliance on annual crops in the future. So that's what has to change. Um, but as you get further and further towards a forest, the energy you have to put in to maintain your system gets less and less because. Uh, you know, if you left this bit of any bit of land in this country, apart from on a mountain top perhaps, to, and did nothing, a forest would emerge. It might take several decades, depends how fast the succession happens, but that is what the land is trying to get to. And so because this system is distinctly forest-like, you know, it's not a natural forest, of course, um, it is a very low in energy input system. So um, as we walk along here, you'll see a couple more tuber crops. Uh, one which is just climbing up the, the canes the other side of this apricot tree and you can see it looks a bit like bindweed the, uh, the leaves on that that's actually yam that's um, Chinese yam which is hardy there's some hardy yams yams are not all tropical um, so I grow two types of yams yeah that's the ones you like Tom um, uh, and they produce fantastic tubers really lovely roasted it's one of our favorite vegetables as a family um, uh, and a bit further on as we walk along you'll see there's a big area down here of actually Chinese artichoke which is um, uh, another tuber crop with the leaves leaves look very similar to betony if you know what our native betony looks like it's very it's the same family very similar looking leaves 
and that, that forms smallish tubers, but lots of them. Um, and, and again, a very nice uh, perennial tuber crop. Okay. So, so we'll, do you, sorry, do you dig yeah. them up each like autumn and then replant in the same place, or wherever you uh, Yes, most or? most of these tuber crops, I'll I'll dig and leave some in the ground right. as I go. Um, so uh, it just regrows in the same so place. Uh, um, I mean, you know, you could do that, of course, with potatoes, but of course, potatoes are so prone to uh, disease that uh, you'll very quickly get a diseased potato crop after a year or two, you know, so, so it's not a viable thing to do with potatoes, but it is with, with you know, things like this. 